Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm here with Spike Curtis. Uh, you guys should have seen him yesterday on the keynote. Um, and I'm Dan Berg. And we're going to take you through a session here to talk about uh, security and services mesh. So what's the problem that we're all trying to solve? Right? We're, we're moving towards highly distributed systems. And those systems, especially moving into the cloud, are complex, right? They're complex to monitor, they're complex to manage, they're complex to secure. Why is that? Well, we're dealing with all kinds of problems uh, in our code. We're dealing with network problems, dealing with lapses in the network itself. How do we deal with that? We're building in retries in our logic. We're dealing, we're building in um, retries, fault injections uh, directly into our code. We're dealing with authentication issues, authentication, authorization. So, but we're, as developers, we're building that into each of our services. We're building that into our code. So every single one has their own mechanism, their own complexities for dealing with that. How do you even observe what's going on in these highly distributed systems? So even understanding the services, how they communicate, what are the lapses in the, in the network, it's very difficult, it's very complicated. So fault tolerance as well is another issue that dealing with a highly distributed system, you have to assume that every single one of the components in your system, it's gonna fail. It will fail eventually. So how do you build in that fault tolerance? Again, as developers, you're building that into your code. You're building that into the logic, and it's very inconsistent. Um, and at the end of the day, you gotta deliver these changes. Your operations, you have to deliver into these highly distributed environments, um, into multiple different clusters, multiple different clouds. You need to reduce the risk as you're delivering that in, and it's very complicated to do that. So how do we do this? What is the service mesh that we do this with? And it, what we use and what we work on is Istio. And unless you've been in a vacuum during this conference um, or you just arrived this morning, uh, this may be the first time you've heard of Istio. But hopefully, uh, this is probably the hundredth time you've heard of Istio. Um, but Istio is a service mesh that allows us to connect, manage, monitor, and secure all of your services in your environments. So why do we have Istio? Why do we have this service mesh? Ultimately, it's to deal with the problems that we just discussed here. But in the end, it's about resiliency. Resiliency and efficiency, dealing with how do you ensure that each of your services can communicate and can communicate well and deal with failures in your environment. How do you manage, because it's so distributed, you've got a lot of microservices, you've got a lot of services in your environment, how do you manage the operations around them? And we wanna move, instead of individual configurations of each of your services, we wanna move to a policy-driven approach so that it's much easier to operate. You need the visibility in your environment, so Istio provides that fleet-wide visibility into all the services that are available in your environment and the policies for managing those. And definitely, you have to have security by default. And you need that security distributed down to the endpoints. So we want to ensure that with Istio, all of your services are always secure from day one. And a lot of this is moving, moving the complexity that we talked about earlier from your code and moving that out of the code and distributing that down to the, to the mesh, down to the endpoints. So let's take a look at Istio. What is, what is the architecture of Istio? Most of you have probably seen this, so we'll go through this very quickly. Istio is distributed into two main sections. There's a control plane and there's a data plane. And the control plane is the APIs and the management of that, of Istio. It has three main components, pilot, which is used for managing the routing uh, of your environment, routing between your services. Mixer, Mixer is responsible for um, collecting the telemetry, the metrics. It's also responsible for managing um, the policy, the fleet-wide policy enforcements uh, and definitions. And Istio Auth is responsible for providing the security, uh, the identity management and the security of your services, the mutual TLS. 
And that is all used to control and manage the, uh, the functionality in the data plane. The data plane is where your applications actually run, where your containers, where your pods actually run in your environment. And the way Istio works is we inject a sidecar um, which is built, in, um, built using the Envoy technology, and it provides that control point that we use for communicating from one service to another service. And it's all programmed using the control plane, the components in the SEO control plane. So that's the general architecture. Um, we don't want to go too much more detail in it. What we want to do now is to hand it over and talk about what are the key things for securing Istio. We're not going to do a general Istio session here. We're going to focus on how do we secure this platform. So I'm going to turn it over to Spike to take you through more of that detail. All right, awesome. Thanks, Dan. So what I'd like to do is spend a little time talking about uh, some of the security features that are available in Istio today. Then we'll do a quick demo, talk about uh, some vulnerabilities and how Istio can help you mitigate those vulnerabilities. And then I'm going to hand it back to Dan, and he's going to talk about the roadmap for the future. So um, the sort of the, my favorite, the big mainline uh, feature that we've gotten into Istio um, around security is the ability to set up mutually authenticated TLS connections for all of the workloads in the service mesh. What that means is that you can turn this on and without making any changes to your application code, you can encrypt the data and authenticate both ends of the connection. We do this um, in a really standard way. Uh, it's standard uh, TLS and we're doing um, it authentication not only of the server side but also the client side. So this is also interoperable with other implementations of TLS. So if you've ever uh, thought about implementing uh, TLS in your infrastructure, um, you probably know that uh, the difficult piece is not actually getting support for the TLS protocol. That's pretty easy. It's built into basically every library um, that communicates uh, over the network. But um, the tricky bit is getting uh, the bootstrapping of trust, those security certificates into each of the workloads. And that's where we spent a lot of time in Istio, is actually building out the um, infrastructure to deliver those secrets so that you can authenticate both ends of the, of the connection. So we do that with a component called Istio CA, um, and it is compliant with the Spiffy protocol, um, which is a set of standards um, that we are currently developing along with uh, the rest of the Spiffy community. But basically, um, this is a way to uh, standardize the way we identify uh, workloads in our environment. So each uh, workload gets a Spiffy ID. We mint a certificate and then um, put that into the workload. Now in Kubernetes today, we're using Kubernetes secrets uh, to mount those certificates. Um, and in other workloads like VMs, we'll have a node agent um, that will securely deliver the certificates to the workload. Once you actually have those certificates, then Envoy is responsible for uh, bringing up the encrypted connection and authenticating both ends. And we also do a secure naming check. So when you make a connection to another pod in, uh, in the mesh, um, we know what, uh, uh, what the services that you're trying to connect to. We examine the, the Kubernetes API to know what service accounts are actually running that service and make sure that the pod that we're connecting to is actually one of the ones that, that is running your service. So we're doing a secure naming check is what we call it um, to make sure that you're talking to a legitimate authority for the service that you're trying to reach. Um, Istio also uh, has an ingress service and um, as a, a sort of standard feature of ingress, uh, we can terminate TLS. Um, this is uh, a, a bit of a work in progress uh, for us because um, we, in, in Istio today, uh, allow you to uh, insert a single certificate into the Istio ingress and serve uh, anything up there. Um, uh, a lot of uh, what we're, we're moving to uh, is having uh, more than one service being able to be exposed by your cluster, and so for that we need um, the TLS SNI, and that's coming later, and Dan will talk a little bit more about that on the roadmap. Um, so the mutual TLS gives you the encryption piece and the authentication piece, which is figuring out who you're talking to. Um, in order to build a secure system, you also need an authorization component. So not just knowing who you're talking to, but being able to answer the question, you know, should I be allowing that request? 
And so in the Istio architecture, we use Mixer for this. So when a request comes into um, an Envoy, before we give that request to the actual workload that is serving that request, we make a check against Mixer um, and uh, pass all the attributes of the incoming request. And then Mixer passes it on to one of several backends. There are built-in backends like whitelists and blacklists and a bunch of different um, authorization backends that are being built uh, speak as we now. So um, once the, uh, uh, the check comes in, uh, Mixer renders a decision on it, returns it to Envoy. Um, if it's okay, then it passes that request onto the back end, which, or in, onto your service, which serves up uh, the response. Um, if not, then it returns a 403. And we do a lot of caching here, so it's not like this is happening on every single request. Um, there's uh, a cache that uh, your local Envoy is keeping, um, and then Mixer will return back an answer, and if another request comes in that has the attributes that were used to render that decision the same, then it'll just uh, make the same decision and not pass it on to Mixer. Mixer is also used for telemetry. Um, and uh, the reason that I'm bringing telemetry up in, in a security talk, in, in addition to like the operational concerns that you have just to being able to debug your application, um, observability is super important from a security perspective. You have to be able to know what's going on um, in your cluster, and you have to be able to see into it to have any chance of detecting bad actors if they are able to slip in. Um, so Mixer supports uh, Stackdriver um, and uh, just outputting to the standard I.O. And again, um, a bunch of uh, additional logging components are, are being built um, uh, you know, right now. So your, your favorite logging backends hopefully will uh, be supported with Mixer uh, before too much longer. Um, we also want to talk about egress policy. Now egress, in this case, uh, we're talking about egress from the service mesh itself. So for, for connections in the service mesh, we have that mechanism of mutual TLS and authentication to know who you're talking to. But you will often have services that want to make external API calls um, to take advantage of, of other services. So if you're running in um, IBM, maybe you want to make calls to the Watson services. If you're running in, in GKE, maybe you want to take advantage of some of the Google Cloud features. So you want to be able to control what the things in your mesh are making calls to. So um, enabling the things that actually are used in your application and disabling um, the ability for your pods to make connections um, to other places. And the reason that you care about that is that um, attackers might be able to slip um, uh, code into uh, your pods through a number of vectors, maybe by corrupting your build system, or maybe by corrupting some public uh, images that you use uh, in your system, um, or maybe even by phishing you know, your system admin or something like that. And when these things, when they come up, they often try and make a connection out to some command and control server or exfiltrate your data. And you can shut that down by using egress policy. All right, uh, so let's do um, a quick demonstration. Um, what uh, I'm gonna show is a cluster um, that is running uh, uh, Kubernetes, and then we have Calico installed in the cluster, um, as well as Istio, and then an application that looks like this uh, in the cluster. And um, this is gonna talk about uh, mutual TLS, and it's also gonna talk about authorization, and the reason that you need uh, both of these things in order to be able to secure what you're doing. So, let's see, get out of full screen. Um, So I've got uh, my application running in the cluster, and um, it has a very simple uh, architecture. It um, is a microservice, so I've got a front-end pod, which is called the customer UI. So that's where uh, people um, actually, uh, my customers actually connect to and, and sort of see uh, on the web. And that connects to a single microservice um, in the back end, which summarizes that person's account. Um, and then I have a database, um, which is actually persisting all the account information. And then um, I'm not showing in the demo, but you know, there's a, a teller UI that um, the teller uses when uh, I go to the bank and either withdraw or deposit money, and that creates transactions which are processed in a microservice, and that actually updates the database. So it's called uh, YAO Bank, yet another online bank, and um, it's very simple, as I said. Um, uh, just uh, shows me my account summary, which is my current balance. 
Um, so I have this running uh, in Istio, and I have mutual TLS enabled. So what that means is that um, if I grab the IP address of the database, even though I actually uh, do have network connectivity to the database from my laptop, so I can ping the database. Um, if I try and make a request to the database, and notice that I have to use HTTPS here because I have um, mutual TLS set up in my cluster. What I get back is handshake failure. And that's because um, the HTTPS listener that is in front of that database is expecting um, an HTTPS connection and it's expecting it uh, to present a certificate that proves that I'm part of the service mesh. My laptop doesn't have one of those, so I get handshake failure and that gets shut down. So we're already doing pretty well here. We're able to encrypt the data and also prevent people from outside the cluster uh, from making contact to any of the microservices that are running inside the mesh. Um, but uh, there are still some vulnerabilities that we want to be able to deal with um, that just mutual TLS um, is not going to help you with. So one of the problems is that um, we're not doing any authorization. We're only doing authentication. We're basically asking, is the person that I'm talking to a member of the cluster? And if they are, I'm going to allow the connection. So that means that if uh, an attacker is able to uh, take over one of my pods by exploiting some vulnerability in the pod, um, they'll be able to make connections anywhere else in my cluster and be able to use that as a base of operations to start launching additional attacks. And I don't want that. So. Um, uh, instead of actually uh, exploiting a vulnerability um, in my cluster, um, since I'm not a hacker, I'm going to cheat and use kubectl exec uh, to show what, uh, what it would look like um, if I was able to exploit a vulnerability. So I'm gonna um, kubectl exec into the customer pod. And basically, um, you know, even though I didn't exploit a vulnerability, from here on out, this is basically um, what, uh, what it would have been like uh, in, from what we know of the Equifax attack. So the attackers there exploited a vulnerability in an uh, Apache struts um, and then used that to install a web console and then use that web console to launch attacks in the rest of Equifax's network. So I'm going to launch an attack against the database from here. And notice that I only need to use HTTP because I have the Envoy that will happily um, encrypt and authorize this connection for me. Slash keys. Um, and I'll do recursive equals true and pipe that through Python's um, JSON tool so that you can see uh, what information I get back. And so um, just from being able to exploit one, one pod, I'm able to connect to the database and I can get um, uh, names, I can get account numbers, I can get balances. I basically owned this database um, from one exploit. So that's definitely bad. Um, another class of attacks is uh, even though I may not be able to completely uh, exploit uh, a pod um, and get remote code execution, it's often easier to convince a pod to tell you something that you shouldn't know, um, to have it uh, read out portions of its memory or read files from disks. So the Heartbleed vulnerability that we had a few years ago is a good example of this, where there was a vulnerability in uh, OpenSSL, and if you had a server that was running with OpenSSL um, that had a vulnerable version, then attackers could convince it to read out portions of the memory, and that was used to steal uh, certificates and secrets. So um, to simulate what that might be like, again, I'm gonna use the uh, uh, Kubernetes API instead of finding a wrong vulnerability. So I wrote a little program that just goes to the Kubernetes API and gets uh, a set of secrets for a service account. And I'm going to grab uh, the secrets for the summary service account. So when I do that, I get uh, both the, the key and the certificate chain as if I had stolen it. And now if I repeat that um, connection attempt uh, and provide the key 
and the certificate, then I'm able to now connect to the database. And I can do something sort of even more transgressive. So um, since I already know account names and numbers, um, I'm going to change my balance. One hundred thousand. No, that's a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, uh, oh, mistyped my uh, account number. There we go. There we go. So now, when I run that and go back to my bank account, you'll see that you know I'm able to yeah go ahead and <laughs> just modify my balance at the bank. So uh, again, we don't want that. So the way we're going to deal uh, with both of these attacks is in the same way. It's by applying uh, authorization policy. So in this case, we're going to use Calico application layer policy. Um, and I'll show you what the policy actually looks like. It's pretty simple. So we're applying network policy. And just like in Kubernetes network policy, we're going to use selectors to select which pods the policy applies to. So this first policy just applies to the uh, customer microservice, and then I list a set of rules. So I'm gonna allow um, any HTTP method or any requests that come in that are gets onto the customer microservice, no matter who it is from. Uh, for the summary microservice, since that's not exposed to the world, I don't want anybody except for uh, things inside my cluster to talk to it. And in particular, I only want the customer um, UI microservice to talk to it because I know that that's the only person using that in my cluster. So I'm going to allow connections only from the customer microservice uh, my, uh, service account. And then for the database, um, I know that the summary microservice is the one talking to it, so I'm only going to allow connections from the uh, service account from there. And I can select service accounts either by name uh, or by labels if I have a lot of service accounts, um, or uh, you'd rather uh, control your policy via labels. So once I apply that policy, oops. let's repeat some of these attacks. I'm actually going to drop the uh, JSON uh, formatting because I don't actually get a JSON response back. I get 403 forbidden. So Istio does uh, the check with. Um, the service account that's provided, and uh, the customer microservice is not allowed to talk to the database, so I get 403 forbidden. Now, I'm also going to repeat this attack where I've stolen a certificate. Um, and when I do that, it also fails. Now, you might wonder, well, how do, we, how do I do that? Because I actually did steal this cryptographic identity. Um, well, uh, in Calico, I'm able to enforce at multiple layers, so not just um, looking at the cryptographic identity, but Calico is monitoring the Kubernetes API, um, and it knows uh, what pods are being run by what service accounts and what IP addresses those pods have. So it's able to verify against the network layer as well, because I'm trying to make a request from a place that um, is not valid for that service account. I can shut it down. All right, let's jump back to the presentation. And uh, one of the things I want you to take away from this is not only that uh, authorization is really important, but also the way that we've built uh, security policy into Istio is based on Kubernetes ideas. So we're using service accounts uh, for identities. Um, all of the Istio configuration is stored as custom resources, so you can look at them with kubectl, you can use all your favorite Kubernetes API tools to look at what that config is. Um, you can use uh, your CI CD systems that uh, are designed to talk to the Kubernetes API and push config into Kubernetes uh, to work with them as well. Um, and uh, the way authorization policy is defined, um, so Calico policy, which I just showed, is based on Kubernetes uh, network policy. Um, and we're also working on uh, Istio RBAC. So if you don't like the, the network policy paradigm and you'd rather an, a role-based access control system, then you can use Istio RBAC, and that is designed to look like Kubernetes RBAC. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back uh, to Dan, who's going to talk about the roadmap. Thanks, Spike. So that was pretty amazing, right? Um, 
I mean, all of that was done. Keep in mind, Spike didn't have to write or change any of his code, right? All those security features, again, were, were made available in the mesh and it provides a way to program the mesh and have it apply to all the endpoints, making the developers much more productive. There's already a lot available today in Istio around securing your services. It's pretty rich, out of the box, already available today, but there's a lot, of, lot more work that we wanna do. There's more features we wanna add to this. Again, we want that secure by default. We want services highly secure by default. So some of the things that we're working on um, in the near future. So this first slide is all about what we're doing in 4Q. We're already in 4Q. You saw the snow yesterday, so clearly we're in 4Q. Um, so around mutual TLS. Uh, one of the things with the mutual TLS right now, one of the problems is when you're in the mesh, you're in the mesh. That means you're communicating mutual TLS between your services. But the problem is, what if you have to call a service that's not in the mesh? It's not participating in the mesh itself, therefore it doesn't have the capabilities to do the mutual TLS. Today, those will fail. Um, what's, what we're working on and what we're gonna be delivering very soon is the ability to enable or disable individual services so you can have a service in the mesh be able to call a service not in the mesh, and it will disable that invocation from mutual TLS. So you can allow those external services to be communicated. The other aspect is, as well, um, one of the key things with Istio is that we want and we allow for you to incrementally adopt portions of the mesh and the capabilities along the way. So as you grow and you mature and you start adopting more of Istio, um, you can turn on those features. Well, one of those might be mutual TLS. So you might have a cluster in which case you don't have Istio authentication turned on. You're just using Istio with no authentication. We wanna provide the ability that there's zero downtime to turn it on, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. I mean, you've got all your services out there that are running with no authentication. We're gonna enable the ability to just turn it on with zero downtime and mutual TLS will be turned on across the mesh. A huge one for us right now is also SNI for the ingress. Spike was commenting on this earlier. This gives us the ability to um, define ingress rules into the mesh and use multiple different host names. Today, we're limited to a single, single host for that. Authorization policy choices. Uh, we want to expand the different choices that you have to be able to authorize your, the identity of those services and, and more importantly, users eventually. So right now we have basically service accounts, but we wanna to move towards role-based access, so RBAC as a way to authentic, authorize your services within the mesh itself. And, and Spike touched on that a little bit, moving towards the Istio RBAC or the way to define service roles and service role bindings using RBAC. OPA is another, um, another technology that we're looking at, the Open Policy Agent, as well as uh, the Calico Unified Policy, uh, two other ways of doing authorization within and your mesh. On the Open Policy Agent, there's actually a talk this afternoon uh, that uh, uh, Lemon, uh, who's uh, my colleague on the uh, Istio uh, security policy team will be giving. So if you're interested in Open Policy Agent, definitely check that one out. And uh, lastly on this slide, uh, basically drinking our own champagne, Istio on Istio, using Istio to manage the control plane for Istio. So managing pilot, mixer, and the CA components. Now moving forward, looking into next year, one quarter out, uh, we're looking at some other capabilities as well. So around mutual TLS, uh, the ability, mentioned it a little bit, but more work around interoperating with non mesh services, so services that are not in the mesh. Um, but a, a key one is to allow you to work with clusters and services that are not just contained within a single cluster. So you have multi-cluster services running outside the cluster. We want to enable the ability to authenticate with a common identity across um, multiple cluster, cluster boundaries. So that work is ongoing. End user authentication. So Right now, in our examples that we were showing here, you're authenticating uh, and using the identity of your services, so using service accounts and, and some of the other uh, capabilities that I mentioned on the other slide with RBAC and others. 
that's still the service account. So we're authenticating and using the identity of the services. But we want to enable the ability for you as a customer of Istio to use your user's identity for defining um, and defining the uh, policies and authenticating within the mesh itself. So it's your user's identity that's going to be coming using JWT in this case. Going even further with doing um, authentication and using different tools around that, we want to le leverage the various identity management systems for, from the cloud providers. So almost every cloud provider has an identity management system. We want to be able to in integrate that into the service mesh and be able to use those identities as well. And then lastly, um, leveraging external certificate authorities. Very much like the Kubernetes in, uh, community is doing with secrets, we want to enable external uh, authorities as well to manage the certificates. So that's basically our roadmap. Uh, if there's other things that you're interested in or you would like to see, please get, get in contact with us. There's multiple ways to contact the folks working on Istio. We have Istio users um, groups, we have uh, we have a Twitter account. Uh, definitely tweet us if there's more that you would like to see uh, in the uh, security of the mesh. Definitely reach out, get involved, go out to the istio.io site, um, start using it, check out all the cool features, showing how you can secure your services, but definitely get involved, give us some feedback. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>